Hey, Golden Ones. It is I, the Kobold. Last week, we added the ball and paddles, learned about collision, and set up a rudimentary AI. Today, we are going to encapsulate what we did last week, add scoring and sound using assets loaded via the content pipeline, and implement player controls. Let's get started. One skill to develop for any programmer is refactoring code. A lot of what you'll code at first will be quick and dirty in order to just get something working. To make that code manageable, you'll need to refactor the code so it's much easier to know what is going on. Last week, we quickly got the paddles and ball working and ballooned the Game 1 class. If we kept doing this, it'd be really hard to know what was going on. So we're going to create two new classes for our game. The first will contain all ball code, while the second will house all the paddle code. We'll have files specific to these objects, and you'll know that the code is managing these objects are in their respective files. We'll need to make some edits to these classes to make them easier to read. Let's start with the ball. In the ball class, we'll rename its rectangle box. We set up some properties to make it where the class is the only object that can modify its box by setting its setter to private. We'll set the getter for the rectangle box to public so that our paddles can reference it. We treat the velocity field the same way as our collision detection needs it. This is the constructor for our ball. It takes a random object reference as a parameter and a boolean to interpret which side to serve to. It sets the ball to the center of the screen and sets its velocity like we did last week. We add this method to set the position of the ball. Our collision detection needs to have some way to tell the ball where to be, so we just have this public method. This way, the actual code setting it is done by the ball itself. Logically, anything that happens to the ball's data, we want the ball class to do it itself. This method is added to increase or decrease the ball's velocity. This will be used by the English calculation and the x-axis increase when hitting the ball. We can have the ball check if it's hit a maximum value here as well, which we have defined as a constant. If it gets too fast, it's unplayable. We also add this method to reverse the velocity. As you can see, we use optional parameters to give this method a number of ways to be called. If you have a default value set for a parameter, you don't have to include it in the call unless you want the value other than the default. In this case, the x and y parameters are set to false, so if you want to reverse the x-axis, you call it with the x being true, and the same goes for y. Finally, we edit the moveBall method to work with our new names. We also change the return value to a tuple. We'll get to how you'll read the value in a moment, but just know that a tuple is an object that can house any number of values or object references, and is an easy way to return more than one value. For now, we are returning an integer to tell us which side scored, like before, and a boolean to tell whether the ball bounced or not. We'll use this boolean later when we implement sound. Let's see what we did to the paddles. We'll do a similar thing here that we did with the ball. We'll change our rectangle to box, changing our properties for the same reason. Since the paddle could be either one, we'll add a boolean field to store which side it's on for easier collision checking. Note that the boolean is a read-only. Read-only means that it can only be set in the constructor. We won't be having paddles change sides, so it's a safe bet to make it read-only. Here's the constructor for our paddle. It takes a boolean as a parameter, as we only need to know which side it is on. It stores that value to its field, and uses it to determine positioning setting its box. Our collision check code needs a major update with us changing how values are stored, so let's go over that. The first thing you'll notice is now we take a ball reference as a parameter. We don't have access to the ball object without this, so we need to know what we're checking collision with. Next, we've condensed our code that we use to check each side. We're calling a method to calculate it for us, which returns a tuple of two booleans. Let's look at that method. As you can see, it checks which side it's on, and returns both whether the ball is going towards it, and if it's past the paddle. Going back to our collision check, this is how you de deconstruct a tuple. By putting your variable definitions in the position that matches the value you are looking for in the tuple, you can get multiple values at once. We'll now check if the two booleans are true, and if they aren't, we return false. There can be no collision here. 
We do another condensation of the code from before. We need to find our delta and if the ball moved too far past our paddle, so we separate this code from the method again using a tuple to return the two values. Here's the get delta method. Again, it checks the side we're on and returns accordingly. If you need to know why we're doing this, you can watch last week's video that went over the code. Now, we can check that boolean to see if it moved too far past and returned false if it did. This code is just like last week's, figuring out where it might have hit the ball and checking if it collided. The only real code that has been changed is where we set the ball's position and change the ball's velocity. As you can now see, we use the methods we created a few minutes ago. Finally, we need to fix our movement method. First of all, I create a bound check method. We'll use this in both the AI and the player's movement method to keep the paddle from going outside the screen and not reach the top of the screen. I talked about how the original Pong had this feature in my video explaining why Pong is a great first game to program, but it makes sure each volley will have an end. The AI's move method is changed to limit the speed of its movement. By setting a ceiling of the speed, we've lowered the difficulty of the AI. I've set the value as a constant just above this method. Last, here is what will be the player's movement method. It just takes a change in Y value and applies it within the limits. This is so that we can quickly set up our input when we get to that part of the video. Now, we just have to edit the Game 1 class to use these objects. Here's our field storing our new objects. In the constructor, we set our array of paddles to an array of two paddle objects. In the initialize, our ball is created using our new constructor. In our update method, we fix our code in the case statements. In the idle case, we call move ball using the new object. In the start case, we create the ball and paddles using our new constructors. In the play state, we use the ball's object move method and deconstruct it so that we have our scoring value. We call the paddle move methods with the new object and check collision on each, boring both values together so that we know if the ball was hit or not this frame. There was a bug in last week's video, as if the ball got fast enough it might score while being hit by the paddle simultaneously. This time, we return if the ball was hit before we check for score, so that no longer happens. We condense the scoring part of the play case so we don't have to use two ifs, while the check-in case now uses the new ball constructor to recreate the ball. In the draw method, we change all draw calls to use the new objects we created. Thankfully, their boxes are public. You can compile, and the game should run just like it did last time. I understand it was quite a bit of work, but by separating the code into their logical objects, it makes it easier to maintain. If you're having bugs with a single object, you really only have one place to go to fix the code. Don't have monster code files. Wait, I'm just pausing for a moment. Help me welcome the six golden gods that have joined our community by subscribing. It's only been a month, but I greatly appreciate the support I've been given. I post weekly content related to games and development, and if you like what you've seen so far, then please like and subscribe. Anywho, back to the video. Monogame has its own built-in content builder and importer that makes it easy to load the assets you need for your game. While not every game uses the built-in solution, it is good to learn how to use it. Open up your content.mgcb file using the mgcb editor. In Visual Studio, you can right-click the file, select Open With, and set MGCB Editor as its default. We're going to set it up to create a sprite font and to build some sounds. In the MGCB Editor, click Edit on the menu, go to Add, and select New Item. For the name, let's just call it Font. And for the type, choose Localized Sprite Font. This will create a file called font.spritefont in your content folder of your project. We can now use Visual Studio to edit this file. I've changed the font name property to Franklin Gothic and have changed the size property to 64. You can edit these values however you want in your own game. Make note that if you're going to release a game yourself, you need to choose a font that you have a license to use. You can't just use any font. 
Let's go ahead and add sound files while we're at it. In the description, I've got a link to a free sound pack made by Groovy on itch.io. I'm using the Click 3 and Click 7 files from the Click folder and the Warning file from the Miscellaneous folder. I add them to the Content file using the MGCBA editor by clicking Edit, Add, and an existing item. I then make sure each sound file is using the sound effect processor, not the music one. Now that we have a sprite font, let's add scoring. First, we'll create a field that contains an array of integers. Like the paddles, we'll have two values stored here, one for each player. We'll also add a sprite font field to hold our new font. In the load content method, we'll load our sprite font. As you can see, the content object defined by our base class has a method to load. The sprite font in between the angle brackets tells its method what the return object should be. We supply the path to the file we want to load inside the content folder without its file extension. In the update method, We'll add this line to the scoring part of the play method so that score increases on a scoring event. In the check in state, we'll now check if the score on either side is greater than 9. If it is, we'll go back to the idle state. To draw the score, we add these two lines to the play and check in case of the draw method. The draw string method of the sprite batch object takes a sprite font, a string, a position on the screen as a vector 2, and a color. It is treated a lot like the draw method, so you shouldn't have any problem with it. Before we compile, let's add sounds too! Make sure to add our using reference at the top of the file to microsoft.xna.framework.audio. This is what houses the sound code in Monogame. We'll add three fields to hold our three sounds. In the load content method, we'll load them like the sprite font was added. Make sure you have sound effect in the angle brackets. Now, we just need to play it in the places where you want to play the sound effect, and they are all in the update method. In the idle case, we need to store the tuples boolean so that we can check if there was a bounce. If there was, we'll play our bounce sound. In the play case, we'll do the same check and play the bounce sound. Before returning after hitting the ball, we'll also play the hit sound. And finally, after scoring, we'll play the scoring sound. You can now compile the code. It should still be two AIs playing a game of Pong, but you should now have sound when the different game events happen, and the score should be there. You got what I got? Good. The final thing we are going to do today is implement some rudimentary player input so that you can beat the AI's butt. The original Pong used a rotary encoder. The closer that exists on a standard computer is the mouse. So we're going to implement our input using the mouse. We're going to check how much the mouse moves across the y-axis each frame and use that value to move the paddle up or down. For now, we are only going to control the left paddle. Since we'll be using the y value every frame, let's create a field holding its value. Pretty much all the code we'll be using will be found in the update method. So in the update method at the top, let's read the mouse. We'll call mouse.getState and store its value. We'll then calculate the change in the y value by taking our new y value and subtracting the old. Now our new y value should be stored in the old y's field. In the idle case of our switch statement, let's wait for a click before changing the start state. We'll add this if statement to our state change. In it, we check if the left button on the mouse has been pressed. In the play case, we just have to change the first AI move to our player move method using the change in Y value we calculated earlier. And this is good enough to be considered done. I decided to add one more line of code to note that the game is waiting for a click in the idle state. In the idle case of the draw method, I add this drawstring to show that you need to click to continue. Go ahead and compile and try it out! You should have the game wait for you to click, indicating that you want to play a game of Pong versus the AI. Then it will let you play a one-on-one -on -one game using your mouse as your input device. Pretty cool, huh?
We learned a lot this week. By refactoring, we have put in the potential for some crazy improvements. Do you think you could add another ball to the game? It's possible. Heck, you could alter the paddles to change size and whatnot. There's a lot you can do when each game object is its own logical object. Do you see the benefits of refactoring? Do you have any questions about what we went over this week? Don't be afraid to leave a comment down below. Next week, we will implement local multiplayer, allowing players to use a wide variety of different controllers. Next week will be the end of this Pong series. I'll be sad to see it go. Till next time, stay gold, code bold, and farewell from the code bold.